This week's presentation block of scripture is 2 Nephi chapters 11 through 19. The first half of the Isaiah chapters that Nephi includes in the Book of Mormon. This is part one. I have divided it because of the length of it. I divide it in two parts. This is part one. And in this part one, we will consider chapters 11 through 14. So with that, let's begin with 2 Nephi chapter 11. Chapter 11, 1 through 3, Jacob spake many more things, Nephi, Jacob, and Isaiah, three special witnesses. The scriptures do not contain detailed doctrinal explanations or extensive doctrinal treatises. They do not purport to re represent more than a fragment of what the prophets and the Savior taught. For instance, that which we have in the New Testament from the lips of the Savior can be audibly quoted with ease in a half an hour. Surely that represents only a fraction of the teachings of the Master. The Scriptures announce and summarize the principles of salvation. They do not negate the need for living prophets and the spirit of revelation to amplify their testimony and doctrines. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles wrote of the significance of the testimonies of these three great prophets, the Lord's manner of teaching and affirming, especially when it involves the covenant, has always provided more than one testimony. His admonition has always been in the mouth of two or three witnesses, so every word be established. Indeed, when the Book of Mormon has come forth, and through the inspired hand of the prophet Joseph Smith, it was prophesied that three shall be shown the plates by the power of God, and in the mouth of three witnesses shall these be established. Those three witnesses were Oliver Cowdery, David Whitner, and Martin Harris. In keeping with this same covenant principle, it is interesting to note that there were three earlier witnesses, special witnesses, not only of the divine origins of the Book of Mormon, but also of divinity himself. These three witnesses were Nephi, Jacob, and Isaiah. It is not only by coincidence that their testimonies appear so conspicuously at the beginning of this ancient record. What is known is that most of the greater views of the gospel found in the teachings of the small plates in Nephi come from the personal declarations of these three great prophetic witnesses of the pre-mortal Jesus Christ, Nephi, Jacob, and Isaiah. These three doctrinal and visionary voices make clear at the very outset of the Book of Mormon why it is another testament of Jesus Christ. One could argue convincingly that the primary purpose for recording, preserving, and then translating the small plates of Nephi was to bring forth to the dispensation of the fullness of times the testimony of these three witnesses. Their writings constitute a full 135 of the 143 pages from the small plates. By the time one has read Nephi, Jacob, and Isaiah in these first pages, a strong foundation has been laid for what Nephi called the doctrine of Christ. End of Elder Holland's quote. All gospel truths and all binding testimony must be considered in the mouth of two or three witnesses. It is this very principle that demanded the coming forth of the Book of Mormon to sustain and defend the Bible. Here Nephi indicates to his people that they are obligated to believe in the Redeemer because they have the testimony of three witnesses, himself, his brother Jacob, and Isaiah, all of whom had seen Christ. We are not left without proof of spiritual things. The justice of eternal law demands that the gospel be properly taught if men are going to be damned for refusing to accept and live it. Evidence of the truthfulness of the gospel must be such that there could be no justification for unbelief upon the day of judgment. Thus Nephi testifies that God prov proveth all his words. Verse 3, 
Malachi, in teaching the law of tithing, quoted the Lord thus, quote, Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, and in principle this applies to all the commandments, not just the law of tithing, if I will not open up to you the windows of heaven and pour out into you a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. End of Malachi. Similarly, the Apostle Paul declared, Prove all things, and then hold fast to that which is good. To those of our day, the Lord has given the Book of Mormon, proving to the world that the Holy Scriptures are true, and that God does inspire men and call them to His holy work in this age and generation, as well as in generations of old, thereby showing that he is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Chap of chapter 11, verse 4, the phrase, the typifying of Jesus Christ, meaning, at times, Isaiah wrote using symbols or types. Nephi spoke of the importance of understanding that all things typify Jesus Christ. The word typify means to represent by an image, form, model, or resemblance. These things serve as a reminder or an emblem of Christ. The scriptures constantly bear witness of and teach of Jesus Christ. Some examples of types include the significance of a male lamb without blemish, which was a similitude of the sacrifice to the only begotten of the Father. The symbols of the sacrament bread and wine represent or typify the atoning sacrifice. These reminders of the Lord and His Saving mission for mankind are designed to instruct us and help us draw closer to the Lord, our Redeemer. Chapter 11, verses 5 through 6, the phrase, My soul delighteth in proving that save Christ should come, all must perish. There is a spirit associated with teaching and testifying of Christ and the saving principles of his gospel that cannot be experienced in any other way. Nephi rejoiced in that spirit as all who have likewise taught and testified of these verities. He reasoned that if there were no Christ, no Savior, to redeem mankind from the lost and fallen state, then there could be no God, for there would be no justice. And if there were no God, there could be no creation. Thus all th created things testify of the existence of God. And Nephi added, quote, He is Christ, and he cometh in the fullness of his own time. End of quote. The emphatic testimony of the Book of Mormon is that Christ is God, the God of the creation, the God of salvation, the God of the Old Testament. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles said concerning the promise of immortality offered through the atonement of Jesus Christ, quote, I wonder if we fully appreciate the enormous significance of our belief in a literal, universal resurrection. The assurance of immortality is fundamental to our faith. The prophet Joseph Smith declared, the fundamental teachings of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven, and all other things which pertain to our religion are only appendages to it. That's the end of Joseph Smith's quote. Back to Elder Oaks. Of all things in that glorious ministry, why did the prophet Joseph Smith use the testimony of the Savior's death, burial, and resurrection as the fundamental principle of our religion, saying that all other things are only appendages to it? The answer is found in the fact that the Savior resurrection is central to what the prophets have called the great and eternal plan of deliverance from death. Christ's resurrection is proof that he was and is and will be a God for eternity. Chapter 11, verse 7, the phrase, God, he is Christ. The emphatic testimony of the Book of Mormon is that Christ is God, the God of creation, the God of salvation, the God of Old Testament. If there was no Christ, then we are not, for there could have been no creation. 
But there is a God in his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that enables the great plan of happiness to operate and enables us to overcome the natural man and become like them if we so choose to use our agency wisely and follow in the footsteps of the Savior. Let's now turn to 2 Nephi chapters 12 through 19, which are which are Nephi's reading of chapters Isaiah 2 through 9 off the brass plates. Let's give a little introduction. Why did the Book of Mormon prophets quote, quite, quote so frequently from the writings of Isaiah? Why should Nephi and Jacob take the time and express this in the precious space on the small plates for the words of Isaiah? What is there in the writings of an eight? century B.C. prophet, one in fact whose oracles are often extremely difficult to comprehend and appreciate, that would be of such worth to the Nephites and latter-day Israel. Why did the, the Nephites quote Isaiah? First, Isaiah was a relatively recent prophet. Many scholars place the date of Isaiah's ministry around 742 to 701 B.C., only 100 to 150 years removed from the days of Nephi and Jacob. Though the time of his labors placed him almost 27 centuries from our day, Isaiah's words would have been viewed by the Nephites much as the Latter-day Saints viewed the sermons and writings of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young today. Second, one of Isaiah's central themes was the destiny of the house of Israel, of which the Nephites were an important branch. And now the words which I shall read, Jacob recorded, are they which Isaiah spake concerning all the house of Israel. Wherefore they may be likened unto you, the Nephites, for ye are of the house of Israel. And there are many things which have been spoken of by which Isaiah may be likened unto you, because ye are of the house of Israel. Third, Isaiah spoke frequently of the status of the house of Israel in the last days. The Book of Mormon is a record prepared and preserved for the people of the latter days. I proceed with my own prophecy, Nephi wrote, after quoting some 13 chapters from Isaiah, according to my plainness, in the which I know that no man can err. Nevertheless, in the days that the prophecy of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, all men shall know of a surety at the times when they shall come to pass. Wherefore, they are of worth unto the children of men. And he that supposeth they are not, unto him will I speak particularly, and confine the words unto mine own people. For I know that they shall be of great worth unto them in the last days. For in that day shall they understand them. Fourth. Isaiah spoke repeatedly of the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Nephi explained, And I did reveal many things unto them which were written in the books of Moses, but that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord, their Redeemer. Thus the reason for Isaiah. As you read Isaiah, look for types and symbols of the Savior and the Redeemer. His book is to help us have a better testimony of the Savior. I did read unto them that which written by the prophet Isaiah. One Book of Mormon scholar has observed that of the 425 verses from Isaiah quoted in the Book of Mormon, 391 of them deal with the ministry or the attributes of the Savior. So again, look and think of what you learn about the Savior. In the Lord's record, recorded instructions to the Nephites, he t twice endorsed the writings of Isaiah. In the second instance, after having quoted Isaiah 54, Jesus declared, You ought to search these things, yea, a commandment I give unto you, that you search these things diligently, for great are the words of Isaiah. If the Lord's example of quoting Isaiah was not sufficient motivation for the Nephites and for us to read, ponder, and pray over the prophetic word, indeed it is one thing to quote the Lord and quite another to have the Lord quote you, then this commandment to do so is surely sufficient, especially for us. What are some suggestions for better understanding Isaiah? 
One, gain an overall understanding of the plan of salvation. Isaiah, like most of his prophetic colleagues, assumed that his listeners and readers understood the things which he spoke. Three examples will suffice. If one understands the doctrine of the pre-mortal existence, then he is certainly more prone to grasp the significance of Isaiah's words, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Likewise, if one already knows the nature of the millennial day, he will discern immediately the context of such words as, the wolf, shall lie, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Finally, if one has studied the life, ministry, and atonement of the Savior from the New Testament and from modern revelation, he is more apt to comprehend the doctrinal import of certain words of these. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, him being Christ. He has put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Number two, study the doctrine of the gathering of Israel. Since so much of the writings of Isaiah center in the scattering and gathering of Israel, competence in that subject greatly facilitates an appreciation of the prophetic words on the matter. Primary source material for such study would include the Old Testament, particularly the books of Moses, and the teachings of the Book of Mormon prophets. Three, use the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is our greatest spiritual commentary on Isaiah. Almost 21 complete chapters from Isaiah and parts of others are cited in the Book of Mormon. Prophetic spokesmen like Isaiah, Jacob, Abinadi, and Christ offer inspired commentary upon numerous passages from Isaiah. May I be so bold as to affirm, wrote Elder Bruce R. McConkie, that no one, absolutely no one in this age and disposition has or does or can understand the writings of Isaiah until first he learns and believes that God has revealed by the mouth of his Nephite witnesses as those truths are found in that volume of Holy Writ. Number four, use modern revelation. In at least 66 places in the Doctrine and Covenants, from 31 different chapters of Isaiah, the Lord uses language identical with or similar to that in Isaiah. In Joseph Smith's sermons, as contained in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, there are explanations explanations or commentary upon 35 Isaiah passages representing 21 chapters. Number five, learn how the New Testament writers understood and explained Isaiah. There are at least 42 Isaiah passages from 25 chapters in the New Testament. The word the words of Isaiah are found frequently in the sermons and writings of Jesus, Paul, and John the Revelator. Number six, know and understand the Old Testament setting and context for Isaiah's writings. Nephi indicated that he had not taught his children after the manner of the Jews, but that he had dwelt at Jerusalem. Wherefore, he adds, I know concerning the regions round about. One cannot hope to appreciate the ominous description of the coming of the Syrian destroyer in Isaiah 10, 2 Nephi 20, for example, if he does not know the whereabouts of such cities as Ias, Migron, Michmash, and Gibeah. Nor can he appreciate the full import of the manual prophecy in Isaiah 7 and 8 if he is unaware of the confederacy of the kingdoms of Syria and Israel as part of their planned overthrow of Judah. Those who have come to understand Isaiah are con con conversant with the manner of prophesying among the Jews. Nephi chose to couch his prophetic utterances in plain and simple declarations, but among his fellow Hebrew prophets it was not always appropriate to do so because of the wickedness of the people. Isaiah and others often spoke in figures using types and shadows to illustrate their points. Just like the Savior spoke in parables, so the wicked would not understand the doctrine, so Isaiah's complexity is used so the wicked would not understand 
the sacredness of his writings. Only those who were interested in seeking the spirit of revelation. Number seven, understand the manner in which prophets may be fulfilled. Some of the most important and far-reaching prophecies may have more than one fulfillment. These prophecies, called pattern prophecies, may come to pass in dual or multiple fashion, that is, at a number of times during the earth's history. One of the best examples of an Old Testament prophecy with multiple fulfillment is Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 29, which says, And it shall come to pass that afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days while I pour out my spirit. End of Joel's quote. On the day of Pentecost, in 50 days after the death of the Savior, the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the people in a marvelous manner. Persons in the area, gathered from far and wide at this time of festival, were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. Peter responded, These are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but that this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. The chief apostle then quoted the passage, the above passage from Joel. When Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith in September of 1823, he quoted several passages of Scripture. After quoting the prophecy of Joel, these same verses that we have read, he said that this was not yet fulfilled, but was soon to be. That is to say, Joel's prophetic prediction came to pass in the meridian of time as well as in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Other examples of Isaiah's prophecies of having dual fulfillment or multiple applications would be the reference to both Lucifer and the king of Babylon, the prophesied destruction of Assyria, and the destructions at the second coming of Christ, and the Emmanuel prophecy dealing with Isaiah and Ahaz on one hand, and with Mary and Jesus on the other. A second key to understanding the manner of prophecy fulfillment is to recognize contemporary events as fulfillment of ancient oracles. In Nephi's language, in the days that the prophecies of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, Men shall know of a surety at the times when they shall come to pass. Number eight, seek the spirit of prophecy and devote yourself to serious study. Because the words of Isaiah are not plain unto you, Nephi explained, nevertheless they are plain unto all those who are edified with the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. One who enjoys the gifts of the Holy Ghost and seeks through sincere and prayerful study of Holy Writ to be led in his spiritual interpre scriptural interpretation by that same spirit which animated Isaiah of old. That person will come in process of time, notice not all at once, to understand Isaiah and to come to treasure his words as spiritual silver and gold. Thus we see that it takes a prophet to understand a prophet and current revelation to understand past revelation. How important is it that we understand Isaiah? Isaiah has been preserved for a reason. Nephi and Mormon went to great efforts to see that Isaiah writings were a part of the Book of Mormon. They are meant to be understood. Nephi never intended that we skip or hurry through the now 16-page segment in the middle of his second book. If our eternal egg salvation, Elder Bruce R. McConkie warned, depends upon our ability to understand the writings of Isaiah as fully and truly as Nephi understood them, and who shall say that such is not the case, how shall we fare in that great day when, with Nephi, we will stand before the pleasing bar of him who said, Great are the words of Isaiah? It just may be that my salvation, and yours also, does in fact depend upon our ability to understand the writings of Isaiah as fully and truly as Nephi understood them. For that matter, why should either Nephi or Isaiah know anything that is withheld from us? Does not that God, who is no respecter of persons, treat all his children alike? 
Has he not given us his promise and recited to us the terms and condition of his law pursuant to that which he revealed to us, what he has revealed to them? End of Elder McClunky's quote. Note, much of the commentary that I will use in the chapters of Isaiah and the Book of Mormon will come from the book called Understanding Isaiah, written by Donald W. Perry, J.A. Perry, and Tina M. Peterson. I note that up front so I don't have to reference it after every single time that I use it. Let's now turn to this Isaiah chapter 2, which is Second Nephi chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 1, word that Isaiah saw. Perhaps like the prophet Joseph Smith and Sidney Rignan, Isaiah actually saw these things described in his prophecies and then recorded them in a scroll or book. Chapter 12, verse 2, the mountain of the Lord, Lord's house, meaning a significant part of what Isaiah saw will begin to be fulfilled, shall come to pass, in a time period focusing upon another location in the earth, namely the Latter-day Zion, Latter Zion of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with headquarters in Salt Lake City, Utah. A little Grand Richards of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the fulfillment of this prophecy. Isaiah saw the mountain of the Lord's house established in the top of the mountains in the latter days. How literally that has been fulfilled in my way of thinking in this very house of God of Jacob right here on this block. He's referring to the temple in Salt Lake City. This temporal, temple, more than any other building of which ha we have record, has brought people from land, every land, to learn of his ways and to walk in his paths. Elder Bruce McConkey, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained the meaning of the phrase, top of the mountains, in reference to the temples, quote, All of holy temples of our God in the latter days should be built in the mountains, in the mountains of the Lord, for his mountains, where the land is, whether the land itself is a hill, a valley, or a plain, are the places where he comes personally and by the power of his spirit to commune with his people. So tops of the mountains just means where a temple resides. Not necessarily that all of them will be built on temple on, on top of mountains. America, as a prophesied location of the mountain of the Lord's house, has been a land of immigration from its earliest discovery and settlement. Isaiah prophesied that all nations shall flow into it. The great immigrations from Europe during the 19th century and continue from all parts of the world today, people and blessed the land and continue from all parts of the world today, peopled and blessed the land, its institutions, and the church. Many Latter-day Saints trace their ancestry to this movement of people from the old world to the new. In addition, people from around the world, both members and non-members of the Lord's Church, continue to visit the area of Salt Lake Temple and the headquarters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Many members of the church attend general conference such as conference sessions semi-annually in Salt Lake City, Utah, while others in various nations around the world view and listen to a conference by means of modern communication systems. Joseph Smith summed up the connection between the gathering of Israel and temple service. He said, quote, The object of gathering the Jews or the people of God in any age of the world was to build unto the Lord a house whereby he could reveal unto his people the ordinances of his house and the glories of his kingdom and teach the people the way of salvation. Joseph Smith also talked concerning the phrase mountain of the Lord's house, quote, The whole of America is Zion itself from north to south and is described by the prophets who declare it that it is the Zion where the mountain of the Lord should be and that it should be in the center of the land, end of quote. Jerusalem is also Zion. The principal features of both Zions will be the temple that will be established in each Zion and the Lord who will sit as king in the throne rooms of the temples. 
chapter 12, verse 2, is a prophecy with multiple application. It refers to the Salt Lake Temple nestled in the hills and mountains, to the future temple of Jerusalem established in the mountains of Judea, and other temples. Joseph Smith learned through Revelation that Zion shall flourish upon the hills and rejoice upon the mountains, and shall be assembled together into the place which I, God, have appointed." Chapter 12, verse 2, the phrase shall be exalted. Spiritually, the temple represents the highest point on earth, which symbolically connects heaven and earth. It is where God's word is revealed to his prophets. Chapter 12, verse 2, the phrase all nations shall flow. Joseph Smith taught that, quote, there should be a place where all nations shall come up from time to time to receive their endowments, end of quote. All nations, which means some people from all nations, shall come to obey the Lord God of all nations and to build the kingdom of God. For something to flow like a river up a mountain, a power greater than gravity must be at work. This power is the power of God and of the temple. Chapter 12, verse 3, the phrase, He shall teach us of his ways, meaning... The Lord will teach us through revelation given through his prophets and apostles through the scriptures and by way of personal revelation. Specifically, we will learn of God's ways in his temple. The phrase walk in his path refers to the path of the just or the straight and narrow path. Leads first through the gates of baptism and then past the portals of the Lord's holy temple. Before being able to walk in God's paths, though, we must first let the Lord teach us of His teach us His laws and His ways. Jesus Christ, of course, is the path or the way in which we must walk. The phrase out of Zion from Jerusalem means these will be the two religious capitals for the kingdom of God during the millennium. One will be located in Independence, Missouri. The other will be found in Old Jerusalem. Both centers will be called Zion and Jerusalem, and they will possess great temples. Chapter 12, verse 3, the phrase, Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained the meaning of the law going out of the going out of Zion, and the word from Jerusalem, quote, Jerusalem of old shall become a holy city where the Lord shall dwell, and from whence he shall send forth his word unto all people. Likewise, on this continent, America, the city of, the new, of Zion, New Jerusalem, shall be built, and from it the law of God shall go forth. These two cities, one in the land of Zion and one in Palestine, are to become capitals for the kingdom of God during the millennium. The phrase, out of Zion shall go forth the law, is an excellent example of how prophecy can have more than one application. President Gordon B. Hinckley remarked, as I contemplate this marvelous structure adjacent to the temple, referring to the conference center, there comes to mind the great prophetic utterance of Isaiah, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. I believe that prophecy applies to the historic and wonderful Salt Lake Temple. But I also believe also, but I believe also that it is related to this magnificent hall, for it is from this pulpit that the law of God shall go forth together with the word and testimony of the Lord. And President Harold B. Lee re wrote regarding this phrase, I have often wondered what the expression meant that out of Zion shall go forth the law. Years ago, I went with the brethren to the Idaho, Idaho Falls Temple, and I heard in that inspired prayer of the First Presidency a definition of the meaning of that term, out of Zion shall go forth the law. Know what they said. He now quotes a part of the dedicatory prayer. 
quote, we thank thee that thou hast revealed to us that those who gave us our constitutional form of government were wise men in the sight, in thy sight, and that thou didst raise them up for the very purpose of putting forth that sacred document as revealed in Doctrine and Covenants section 101. We pray that kings and rulers and the people of all nations under heaven may be persuaded of the blessings enjoyed by the people of this land by reason of their freedom and under thy guidance and be constrained to adopt similar government systems, thus to fulfill the ancient prophecy of Isaiah and Micah that out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord of Jerusalem. So President Henry B. Lee considered out of Zion shall go forth the law as referring that the, the referring to the Constitution of the United States, that that law of the land was also what Isaiah was referring to. Again, you see Isaiah, multiple meanings, multiple dispensations, multiple applications. Chapter 12, verse 3, Word of the Lord. Joseph Smith taught the manner in which the Lord's word would proceed forth. Quote, Moses received the word of the Lord from God himself. He was the mouth of God to Aaron, and Aaron taught the people in both civil and ecclesiastical affairs. So it will be when the purposes of God shall be accomplished, when the Lord shall be king over the whole earth, and Jerusalem his throne. The law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Chapter 12, verse 4, the phrase, Time of Peace. Elder Dallin H. spoke of the peace that will finally come to the earth after the Lord's second coming. He also identified the reason why there will be no peace prior to that time. Quote, Many take comfort from the Old Testament prophecies that nations will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. But this prophecy only applies to that time of peace which follows the time when the God of Jacob will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For now, we have wars and conflicts and everywhere they are rooted in violation of the commandments of God. Chapter 12, verse 4, the phrase, He judges, or another way that could be read from the Hebrew, settle the case, referring to Jesus, under the authority of the Father, will be the judge of the world. Jesus will settle the case, this is down here, when he makes his great and dreadful appearance on earth. The phrase plowshares and pruning hooks, a plowshare is the cutting blade of a plow, a pruning hook is a tool with a hooked blade that is used for pruning plants. Swords, spears, plowshares, and pruning hooks all have blades. Plowshares and pruning hooks are useful and conductive for the work, ethic, and eventual prosperity, therefore representing instruments of peace and prosperity. The phrase, learn war anymore, referred to. Earlier in this verse, Isaiah tells us that during the millennium, nations will not participate in war, for they will destroy their weapons and make them into useful implements. Now the prophet informs us that the nations will not even learn, meaning study or gain knowledge of war. Chapter 12, verse 5, the phrase, walk in the light of the Lord. To walk in God's light demonstrates a spiritual approach to life, righteous living, and a godly attitude. Jesus Christ is the way in which we should walk. Here the light of the Lord is set in the context of the temple. Walk in the light of the Lord has incalculable personal value because the light enlighteneth our eyes, quickeneth understanding, infuses joy into the soul, and dispels darkness so that the dark veil of unbelief is cast away. Chapter 12 of Nephi, verse, of, of Nephi chapter 6 through 9, Isaiah addresses or prays to Jehovah. 
Both the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith translation add the expression, O Lord, at the beginning of this section, which indicates that Isaiah is addressing the Lord in prayer. Isaiah presents a list of sins committed by Israel, including practicing false temple worship, which causes the Lord to forsaken members to forsake which causes the Lord to forsaken members of the house of Israel because of their wicked condition. The term forsaken has the sense of abandoning the house of Israel and leaving them without the spirit of the Lord, revelation of God's word through these living prophets. They were replenished from the east, or according to Isaiah 2, 6, footnote 8, they were filled, supplied with teachings, alien beliefs, or false gods like the Philistines and soothsayers, which are individuals who pretend to prophesy or predict the future. In other words, they forsook the gospel of the Lord for teachings and priorities of the world, seeking after earthly riches. When they sought these riches, which are symbolic of worldly materialism, ancient Israel spoke, broke the law of Moses, for they were commanded, Neither shall you greatly multiply to yourself silver and gold. The Lord's people are ever commanded to seek him rather than the riches of the world. That's in 12.7. Build up arms and weaponry by building up horses and chariots. These represent warfare and military might. Verse 7, worshiping idols. In verse 7, worshiping idols, this term refers to both heathen deities constructed of wood and stone and to more abstract things that may become excessive excessively devoted to including worldly wealth, the honors of men, and the things of the flesh. In chapter 12, verse 8, and indulging in pride. The mean or ordinary man and the great, those who have achieved worldly status and position, refuse to humble themselves and bow down to Jehovah. They are guilty of pride. Isaiah, whose testimony lists the sins of Israel, stands as a witness against the house of Israel in Jehovah's courtroom. Inasmuch as the children of Israel saturate their lives with sin, as Isaiah suggests in the terms replenish and fool used several times, and fail to hearken to the voice of many prophets by repenting and returning to God, Isaiah can deliver his plea or prayer before the Lord, forgive them not. Chapter 12, verse 9, all of which stands in opposition to the law of Moses. People in our day are also guilty of such sins. So this was chapter 12, verses 6 through 9, not chapter 6 through 9. That was comes from verses 6 through 9. On our, our, on four occasions, Isaiah uses the word fool or its equivalent replenish, make full to point out that Israel has saturated the land with silver, gold, war vehicles, and idols rather than filling it with righteousness. Isaiah's multiple use of fully, multiple use of full, full, of the word full corresponds with the phrase fully ripe found in the Book of Mormon. It might be said of ancient Israel that the cup of their iniquity was full, as Jehovah says of our dispensation. Behold, the day has come when the cup of wrath of my indignation is full. Chapter 12, verses 10 through 11, the phrase, Fear of the Lord, man shall be humbled, meaning these two verses also clarifies the great contrast between the exaltation of God and the lowliness of mankind. For the phrase, Fear of the Lord, the Jerusalem Bible reads, At the sight of terror of the Lord. When the day of the Lord shall come, the wicked will be humbled, brought down, brought low, and made low. They will seek low areas of the earth, a phrase that recalls hell, the grave, and the underworld. Holes, caves, clefts, and rocks that are normally used by dark seen creatures like moles and bats. It is better for us to humble ourselves than to be compelled to be humble. In contrast, Lord is described as one who causes fear, possesses majesty, is exalted, and has great glory. 
The events that will accomplish the second coming will be dreadful for the wicked and the proud and haughty. They will be brought down into the dust through the power and might and glory of Jesus Christ, and God alone will be exalted. The terms glory and majesty speak of God's royalty and kingship. Chapter 12, verse 12, the phrase, Day of the Lord. This phrase often refers to the events connected with Jesus' second coming. The day of the Lord is mentioned five times in this section to emphasize its importance. Throughout Isaiah, the phrase day of the Lord, in that day, day of visitation, day of his fierce anger, and day of the Lord's vengeance are found more than 55 times. Underscores how frequently Isaiah's writings emphasize the last days and the second coming. According to modern-day revelation, our era is called today, until Christ comes. Behold, now it is called today, until the coming of the Son of Man. For after today cometh the burning. Tomorrow all the proud and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble. Doctrine and Covenants 64, 23-24. Chapter 12, verse 12, the phrase, soon cometh. This phrase parallels the expression, I come quickly, found several times in the Doctrine and Covenants. The expression warns us to be prepared always for the coming of the Lord. For the coming of the Lord, it will happen suddenly. So when I come quickly, doesn't mean that it's like in the next two months. It means when it happens, it will happen very quickly and suddenly, and all of a sudden, the second coming is over, and it's done, and it's there. There will be no time to repent. It will be done quickly, suddenly. The phrase, upon the nations, means the Lord's judgments will be universal. Chapter 12, verse 13, cedars of Lebanon and oaks of Babylon, referring to Bashan is a region east of the Jordan River and north of Agent Gilead in Israel. Lebanon is a mountain range in Syria known for its fine cedars. Symbolically, the scriptures consistently use trees to represent men. Green trees are righteous people, and dry trees represent the wicked. In the context of 2 Nephi 12, 11-21, oaks and cedars are like proud people who, Isaiah informs us, are high and lifted up, and the day of the Lord shall come upon them too. Uh, that could be a typo. That could be verses 11 through 12 instead of 11 through 21. Chapter 12, verse 14, mountains and hills. In this context, mountains and hills represent apostate temple systems that attempt to imitate the Lord's true temple, the mountain of the Lord. Chapter 12, verses 15 through 22, describes some of the status symbols of the day. Verse 15, including the man-made defense of towers and fenced walls, which represent humanity's attempt to create protection from enemies and potentially harmful situations. They are mankind's way of relying on the arm of flesh. By contrast, the righteous rely on God for protection, for because... Because for them, God is a high tower and a wall of fire. Verse 16, beautiful crafts or pleasure ships are important, are import, that imported such luxury items as silver, gold, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Perhaps because of the city's connection with wealth and influence, the destruction of Tarshish and its ships symbolize the Lord's judgment on the proud and arrogant. The phrase pleasant pictures, the word rendered pictures means something figured or with imagery upon it. A cognate word is used of idolatrous imagery and of idolatrous imagery painted on walls. Since the word here occurs in close connection with ships, the reference may be to the cells, which often embroidered with figures in ancient times. Verse 17, the arrogance of man will be made low and God will be exalted. Verse 18, God will destroy and stop the existence of idol worship. Verse 19, the earth's proud and wicked attempt to hide in the cavities of the earth because they feel more comfortable as do moles and bats. 
in darkness, they try to hide from God and his glory, and they find themselves in Satan's domain beneath God and his saints' dwelling place. The phrase, shake the earth, many prophets have placed earthquakes in the context of the end of time. Verse 20, idols of silver and gold represented any kind of false deity such as money, illicit sex, and power. Isaiah compares the moles and bats, animals that dwells in the holes of the rocks and the caves, to the proud and the wicked. Verse 21, the proud and the haughty are found in the clefts and tops of rocks. In times of trouble, the wicked choose to flee into the rocks of the earth, rejecting Jehovah, who is the rock of Israel and the rock of heaven. Meanwhile, the righteous build upon the rock of Christ and will never fall. It is possible that the cleft of the rocks mentioned in Isaiah 2.21 will be produced by the earthquake mentioned in Isaiah 2.19. Verse 22, man or mankind comes from the dust, is corruptible, and enjoys only, and enjoys only brief glory. Without Jesus Christ, man remains in this state. But with acceptance of Jesus and reliance on his ability to save, man can become like his maker. God gave man the breath of life, and man is forever reliant on God for all things, including air to breathe. King Benjamin reminds us, are we all not beggars? Do we not all depend upon the same being, even God, for the substance which we have? In summary, the haughty and the proud will fall, and the worldly treasures shall crumble away in the presence of Christ, the great Jehovah. President Henry B. Iron, the first presidency, suggested that learning to be humble is essential preparation for the great day of the second coming of the Lord, when the Savior will be exalted among the nations. Quote, I began to read in 2 Nephi 12 and thought, the Lord is speaking to me. Why is it he want, what is it he wants to tell me directly? Then I came to a verse in Isaiah passage that jumped out as if it were already underlined. And the phrase was, And it shall come to pass that the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall bow down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. This is describing the day when the Savior will come, a day we all look for and want our students to prepare for. This scripture says that in that day, all of us who thought we were special and wonderful will seem smaller and the Lord will be exalted. We will see better who he is, how much we love him, and how humble we should be. I understand why Isaiah told me it would be helpful to receive the day when the Lord would be exalted and to know how much I depend upon him. We need him, and the faith we have in him makes us see him as great and exalted, and ourselves as small and dependent. End of quote. Let's now turn to 2 Nephi chapter 3, which is quoting Isaiah chapter I am sorry, 2 Nephi 13, which is comparable to Isaiah 3. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, Anarchy and ruin prophesied for Jerusalem and Judah. Isaiah prophesies that anarchy and ruin will come upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judea because of the sinful nature of their inhabitants, whose speech and actions are against the Lord, and whose sins are likened to the sins committed in Sodom before its destruction. That's verses 8 through 9. Anarchy may also come because of the Lord's removing the supply of bread and water famine or drought, or by the loss of righteous leadership in the region, for God, we are told, will remove the region's luminaries. That's chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. And children, babes, and women will become their rulers, verses 4 and 12. These prophecies seem to have a double application referring to judgments against ancient Judah as well as against the wicked in the last days. Chapter 13, verse 1, the phrase, Jerusalem, Judah. This refers to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah. In a symbolic sense, they can also refer to an apostate people in the latter days who will be subject to such judgments as are detailed here. 
The words bread and water, these are perhaps representatives of all forms of physical nourishment, but they also have spiritual connotations in reference to the Lord, who is metaphorically the bread of life and the living water. Certainly God removes his presence from us when we become wicked, just, in bread, just as bread and water will be removed from Judah and Jerusalem for their iniquity. Thus this prophecy foresees both physical and spiritual famine. Chapter 13, verses 2 through 3, Mighty Man, Orator. Isaiah lists 11 types of people as a way to represent all who have achieved community, honor, and status, whether religious, prophets, civic, judges, political, men of war, artistic, craftsmen, and orators, or in wisdom, older men. The nation will be left without military might. Mighty man, man of war, captain of fifty, spiritual guidance, prophets, wise men, ancients, justice, judges, and artisans, skilled craftsmen. All of these will be removed from Jerusalem. Chapter 13, verse 4, chicken slash babes, children slash babes, meaning these terms may refer to the untrained and young who become rulers because, com because committed Community authority has been taken away by the Lord. Church 13, verse 5, the phrase, The people shall be oppressed. The people will trouble and abuse one another because of their lack of love for the Lord and for their neighbor. The phrase, Child shall behave himself proudly, refers to, In these days it may be difficult for children to show neither deference nor honor to their elders. This is another evidence of the breakdown of the normal society and family order. The word base, the wretched, will show no respect for those with integrity. This appears to show how anarchy has prevailed with the breakdown of society. Chapter 13, verse 6, the phrase, Thou hast clothing. The people are so poor and desperate due to devastation and anarchy that even one with clothing will qualify as a leader. Perhaps his clothing indicates wealth or preparedness. Chapter seven, 13, verse 7, the phrase, I will not be a healer, make me not a ruler, referring to, even the one nominated to lead them because of his clothing will be powerless to alleviate the hunger and suffering. Healer used here, the term refers to someone who built, binds up wounds or sores. The same Hebrew Root is used in Isaiah 1 6. The wounds and bruises and purifying sores of Israel have not been closed, neither bound up, neither softened with ointment. The phrase neither bread nor clothing, meaning it is unclear why the man denies having clothing. Perhaps he has insufficient for the group, or maybe he simply does not want the responsibility of leading the others during such troubled times. Chapter 13, verse 8, tongues slash doings. Tongues refer to the words and doings to the actions of the people. The term for explains that Jerusalem has stumbled because Israel's work have been against the Lord. The, fly, the phrase eyes of his glory refers to God who possesses all glory, has full knowledge of the evil doings of Jerusalem and Judah. He sees them with his eyes. Chapter 13, verse 9, the phrase, the show of their countenance. Righteousness and wickedness affect both attitude and appearance. President Brigham Young said, quote, those who, have got the for those who have got the forgiveness of sins have countenances that look bright, and they will shine with the intelligence of heaven. Whether we're white, wicked or righteousness, that frame that way of being will show up in our countenances. The wickeds have a very dark countenance. President David O. McKay taught, No man can disobey the word of God and not suffer for doing so. No sin, however secret, can escape retribution. True, you may lie and not be detected. You may violate virtue without it being known by anyone who would scandalize you. Yet you cannot escape the judgment that follows such transgression. The, law, the lie is lodged in the recesses of your mind and imprinted on, and, and, 
uh, recess of your mind, an impairment of your characters that will reflect sometime, somehow, in your countenance or bearing. Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah are preferred, perfect examples of wicked communities. Their inhabitants committed a variety of sexual sins, and they also failed to care for the needy and oppressed. These are all phrases from verse 9. The phrase, they cannot hide it. The wicked cannot hide their wickedness from God because he knows all things, and there is not anything save he knows it. God knows all their woe. words. The word woe. The two woes indicate the trouble, sorrow, or affliction that will come upon the wicked. The term woe is found 22 times in Isaiah. The phrase, reward evil unto themselves, means a better translation is provided by the New International Version. The, that being, they have brought disaster upon themselves. Second Nephi 27, 27 gives this description of those who think they can hide in their countenances from the Lord. He said, And woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? And they also say, Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. But behold, I will show unto you, saith, Showeth unto them, saith the Lord of hosts, that I know all their works. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? In other words, can we say God who made us does not know me? Or God who created us does not understand? Chapter 13, verse 10, the phrase, it is well. This is a statement of approval and blessing. The word fruit, meaning in prophetic language, trees often symbolize people and their good fruits represent good works. The righteous, I'm sorry, the fruits of righteousness come through the atonement of Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Then Isaiah writes that the righteous will eat the fruit of their doings. This might signify that the righteous will enjoy the fruits of the Spirit, which include love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Evil trees, however, will bear rotten fruit, which is represented of the works of the wicked. Christ taught, by their fruits ye shall know them. Chapter 13, verse 12, the cause the phrase, cause thee to error. President Ezra Chap Benson interpreted 2 Nephi 13, 12, quote, And so today the undermining of the home and family is on the increase, with the devil anxiously working to displace the father as the head of the home and create rebellion among the children. The Book of Mormon describes this condition when it states, And my people, children, are their oppressors, and women shall rule over them. And then these words, and consider these words seriously when you think of those political leaders who are promoting birth control and abortion. O oh, my people, they who lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy path. End of quote. Chapter 13, verses 13 through 14 Chapter 13, verse 13, through chapter 14, 1, judgment against the daughters of Zion. We recall that Isaiah 1, 2 through 5, and 10 through 15, verse 10 through 15, feature a courtroom scene wherein the Lord pronounces a legal decision on the house of Israel. A similar scene also with Israel as the accused appears in 13, 13 through 14, 1. That should be 14.1. Sorry, we got that misprint. There. In which one again the Lord stands as both prosecutor and judge. See 13.13. Jesus Christ has two legal roles in the heavenly courts. The first is as an attorney or advocate. Jesus Christ is the righteous. Jesus Christ the righteous is the advocate with the Father who pleads the case of righteous souls. 2 Nephi 3, 13-17 describes a heavenly courtroom scene where the Lord stands both to plead and to pronounce a judgment. Jesus Christ's second role is as the judge in the divine court who passes judgment on the wicked. 
Standing was important in ancient Israel courtrooms where the judge stood to pronounce judgment. The reason for the judgment is clear. The Lord will enter into judgment because the children of Israel and the princes, the leadership, mistreated the poor. See verse 14 in chapter 13. To spoil the poor means to take force forcefully the goods and property of the poor through high taxation as booty during wartime or by other means. The phrase, ye have eaten up my vineyard, is a symbol of the chosen people and the rulers of Israel were called to be watchmen over the vineyard. Instead of guarding the Lord's vineyard, they had oppressed the people and consumed the vineyard. Social justice for the poor is a constant theme in Isaiah's writings. Beat God's people. <clears throat> Let me read that sentence again. Social justice for the poor is a constant theme in Isaiah's writings. Beat, meaning God, beat God's people, verse 15, which may refer to actual physical punishment or to economic hardship due to insufficient high taxes and duties levied or assessments imposed upon the poor. It may also refer to attitude, for we are also condemned for the state of our hearts. Thus, because of the breakdown within society, it is like beating people to pieces and grinding the faces of the poor. The phrase, and were proud and haughty, verse 13, verse 16 through 23. The judgments of God described in 13, verses 17 to 26 include the following. The Lord will smite the offenders with a scab on the head, verse 17. He will take away the finery and showy materialism, verses 18 to 24. And he will make them bald and cause them to burn stink, wear rent clothes, fall in war, and become desolate. That's verses 24 to 26. Second Nephi thirteen twenty four 24 through 26 seems to indicate that the phrase daughters of Zion, 316, speaks not just against women, but against all Israel, male and female. Another possible interpretation of the object of God's prosperity is that in 13, 14 through 15, 25, he is talking to males. And in 13, 16 through 24, he is talking to females. In these verses, we can see a good example of dualism. Isaiah shows that the wickedness prevailing in Israel and Judah include the women who were proud, arrogant, and more concerned with their clothing, jewels, and personal appearance than with righteousness. But these verses can also be applied in the latter days when women and men will once again lose sight of their proper priorities and they will pay more attention to their clothing, jewels, and personal appearances than righteousness. Chapter 13, verse 16, the phrase, Daughter, Daughters of Zion. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained who the phrase, Daughters of Zion, was referring to and what the verse in 2 Nephi 13 said about them. Quote, the standards expressed by the general authorities of the church are that women, as well as men, should dress modestly. They are taught properly to they are taught proper deportment and modesty at all times. It is, in my judgment, a sad reflection on the daughters of Zion when they dress immodestly. Moreover, this remark pertains to men as well to the women. The Lord gave commandments to ancient Israel that both men and women should cover their bodies and observe the law of chastity at all times. End of quote. The plural daughters of Zion may also refer to ancient Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah and to Samaria and the northern kingdom of Israel. The phrase may be literally referring to actual women or it may point to women as symbols of pride and sin in the last days. Note the women's clothing described in verses 18 to 24 and the actual women that seem to be identified in 4.1 or that should be in 14.1. <clears throat> the phrase may be a little referring to actual women, or it may 
point to women as symbols of pride in the last days. Note the women's clothing described in 13, 18, 24, and the actual woman that seemed to be identified in 14, 1. This interpretation parallels Isaiah's condemnation of male pride and the sick nature of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. 13 through 16. Haughty, stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, refers to women becoming more forward and seductive in appearance and actions like prostitutes. President Russell M. Nelson warned, From the dawning of time, women have been blessed with a unique moral compass, the ability to distinguish right from wrong. This gift is enhanced in those who make and keep covenants, and it diminishes in those who willfully ignore the commandments of God. I hasten to add that I do not absolve men in any way from God's requirements, for them also to distinguish between right and wrong. But, my dear sisters, your ability to discern truth from error to be society's gardens of morality is critical in, the la in these latter days, and we depend upon you to teach others to do likewise. Let me be very clear about this. If the world loses the moral rectitude of its woman, the world will never recover. Boy, we seem to be on that path. We Latter-day Saints are not of the world. We are of covenant Israel. We are called to prepare for a people for the second coming of the Lord. End of quote. Chapter 13, verse 16, the phrase stretched forth necks is an idiom describing haughtiness, pride in self, and scorn towards others. Also, it portrays women who look sideways to see if others notice their beauty as they prance along the way or as they look upwards with high heads in a proud manner. For the children of Israel in all eras, the expression denotes a people who pay idolatrous heed to others rather than to God above. The phrase mincing and making a tinkling with their feet means the women who wore costly ornamental chains connecting rings about the ankles. These were often adorned with bells. Chapter 13, verse 17, the word scab and phrase uncover their head. These terms reflect the Lord's judgment on Israel. Baldness is one of God's judgments on the wicked, and it may refer to the humiliating punishment known among the Babylonians in which the hair of the forehead would be shaved off. In addition, since the Hebrew word for atonement means covering, an uncovered head may point to one who has lost some of the privileges of the atonement. Kyle and Delich, two great Old Testament scholars, gave the following description of the worldly woman described, Isaiah is describing in 2 Nephi 13, 16-17, But notwithstanding the dramatic vividness with which the prophet pictures to himself this scene of judgment, he is obliged to break off at the very beginning of his description because another word of Jehovah comes to him. This applies to the women of Jerusalem, whose authority at the time when Isaiah prophesied was no less influential than that of their husbands who had forgotten their callings. Jehovah has spoken because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk about with extended throat and blinking with the eyes, walking about with tripping gait and tinkling with their foot ornaments. The Lord of all makes the crown of the daughters of Zion scabbed, and Jehovah will uncover their shame. The inward pride shows itself outwardly. They walk with extended throat, that is, bending the neck back, trying to make themselves taller than they are, because they think themselves so great. They also went winking the eyes, that is, casting voluptuous and amatory, that means to love, glances with affected innocence. They walk about tripping, that is, taking short steps, just putting the heel of one foot against the toe of the other, as the Talmud explains it. They could only take short steps because of the chains by which the costly foot rings Akazim wore above their ankles were connected together. These chains, which were probably ornamented with bells, as is sometimes the case now in the East, they used to tinkle as they walked. 
They made an ankle tinkling with their feet, setting their feet down in such a manner that these ankle rings knocking against each other. They were not modest virgins, but cold masculine virginians, if I'm, uh, vi virgins, which means manly women. Nevertheless, they tripped along, tripping as a child's step. Nevertheless, they tripped along. Although well-versed in sin and old in years, the women of Jerusalem tried to maintain a youthful, childlike appearance. They, therefore, tripped along with short, childish steps. The women of the Mahadian East, Mohammedan East, still take pleasure in such coquettish tinklings, although they are forbidden by the Quran, just as the women of Jerusalem did in the days of Isaiah. The attractive influence of natural charms, especially when heightened by luxurious art, is very great, but the prophet is blind to all this splendor and seeing nothing but the corruption within, foretells to these rich and distinguished wisdom a foul and by no means ascetic fate. The sovereign ruler of all the world smite the crown of their head, from which long hair was now flowing with scab, and drew hova would discover would uncover their nakedness by giving them up to violation and abuse at the hands of coarse and barbarous foes. The greatest possible disgrace in the eyes of a woman who covers herself as carefully as she can in the presence of any stranger. So you can see why Isaiah is commenting upon this wickedness, because you can see all of these same attributes and wicked priorities in latter day in the latter days, and among latter day Israel. Verse 13, verse 18, the word finery, the list of apparel in verses 18, chapter 13, 18 to 23, presents highly visible items of clothing and stand opposite the plain garments of Zion mentioned in the Third Covenants 4240. The phrase, the Lord will take away the bravery, refers to how the people put their trust in material things instead of the Lord in the latter days, in the days of the Lord. They will come to know that material things will not bring peace, safety, and salvation as they lose their material possessions because of the breakdown of society and the economy caused by wickedness and trusting in the arm of flesh, which the Lord will condemn and take away. Chapter, 19, chapter 13, verses 19 through 23. These terms describe fashions that were popular among the worldly women in Isaiah's day. Muffler, veil, bonnet, meaning headdress, tablets, per perfume boxes, earrings, charms or amulets, nose rings, which is a nose ring, changeable suits of apparel, meaning clothing for festivals only, mantle, overcloak, wimples, a type of shawl or veil worn over the head, Crisping pins erroneously rendered as hair curling implements. The Hebrew suggests a bag like a modern purse or handbag, and glasses most authority translates as a metal mirror, although some suggest transparent clothing, and hoods, turbans, co head cover wrapped by hand. Chapter 13, verses 24 to 26, the fruit of the transgression upon the daughters of Zion, meaning the prophet contrasts their former beauty with the results of the judgments. Because of their weakness, the beauty, the pride, and the fashion will become tragedy, disaster, slavery, and humiliation. The, the words fragrance and beauty, the entire verse sets forth God's judgments on the daughter of Zion. God will replace prosperity and refinement with humiliation and stink. The fragrance may have reference to the expensive balm oil imported from Ramah and Sheba. It was used as a cosmetic and for religious purposes. It could also refer to the use of perfumes in the last days. The stink that will come instead of sweet smell could possibly be from festering wounds. The girdle in verse 24 was the sash used to fasten the outer clothing. Kyle and Dilly showed that the rent, which was to replace it, was the rope used to bind slaves. Sackcloth was black goat's hair worn at times of great mourning. The burning refers to the branding that offer, often accompanied by accompanied ones being made a slave. 
blackness and sackcloth, meaning self and pulled baldness, verse 24, sitting on the ground, verse 26, and sackcloth, 24, are all symbols of mourning mentioned in connection with the terms lament and mourn in 1326. Clearly, the context of verses 24 to 26 is mourning caused by God's judgments on Judah and Jerusalem as well as upon the world in the latter days. Thus, Kyle and Delitz translate verse 24, and instead of and Instead of balmy scent, there will be moldiness, and instead of sash, a rope, and instead of artistic windlicks, a baldness, and instead of the dress cloak, a frock of sackcloth, branding instead of beauty. All because they wanted to enjoy the things of the world more than enjoy the things of Jehovah. That's a high price to pay to reject God. Chapter 13, verse 25, sword slash war, meaning this may be a continuation of judgment being poured out upon Jerusalem and Judah. Verse 26, her entrances, Jerusalem is desolate and no longer has gates, but only openings or entrances. Gates may symbolize false security or pride. We now turn to 2 Nephi chapter 14, which is comparable to Isaiah chapter 4. 14 verse 1, in that day. This reminds us again that these events are connected with our day or the last days. Verse 1 of chapter 4 seems to continue the thought of chapter 3 rather than to begin a new thought. Seven women, the phrase means the head note to the chapter in the LDS edition of the Bible places this prophecy in the millennium because war has claimed the lives of many of the men of Jerusalem, identified in 1325. The ratio of men to women is unequal, thus seven women take hold of one man. Number seven may be literal or symbolic. The conditions under which these women would accept this marriage, eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, are contrary to the Lord's order of marriage. It is the husband's duty to provide for the bride. But in this prophecy, Isaiah indicates that these seven women will provide for themselves. To be unmarried and childless in ancient Israel was a disgrace. So terrible would condition in those times be that the childless in ancient Israel was a disgrace. So terrible would condition in those times be that women would offer to share a husband with others and expect no material support from him if they could claim they were married to him. The phrase, take away our reproach, this phrase suggests that the condition mentioned in verse 1 is caused by the scarcity of men as a result of the devastation of war mentioned in 2 Nephi 13, 25-26. Reproach means, this word means disgrace caused by the barrenness of women, a result of not having a husband. Chapter 14, verse 2, in that day, meaning the latter days. The phrase branch of the Lord. In Hebrew, the term branch often symbolizes the Messiah. It can also refer to a righteous group of the house of Israel who have been cleansed and redeemed. The context of this section suggests that the branch represents a specific remnant of branch or of Israel that remains in Israel after God's judgments identified in 2 Nephi 3. The word fruit, those who are escaped of Israel and Judah, will be blessed with the bounties and blessings of the earth. The earth will be fruitful once again because of the presence of temples. The temples, says John Lindquist, is associated with abundance and prosperity. Indeed, is perceived as the giver of these. Again, we are reminded of the promise of the Book of Mormon prophet that those who are obedient to God's commandments will prosper in the land. The phrase escaped of Israel refers to members of the house of Israel who, through personal righteousness, escaped the judgments that came upon the wicked. Those who are escaped of Israel and Judah will be blessed with the bounties and blessings of the earth. They will consist of both Jews and other members of the house of Israel. 14 verse 3, the phrase left in Zion, remain in Jerusalem. This, these phrases refer to those who will survive the last day judgments of God that will destroy many of the people on earth. 
The word holy, the Hebrew word term translated as holy, has the root meaning of temple. Isaiah is saying, in essence, that those who remain in Jerusalem shall be called as temple people, presumably because they worshipped in the temple. The group becomes holy because of the cleansing purging process identified by Isaiah as the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. Also, God is called the Holy One in the last days. Those in Zion will be like God in their holiness. The phrase written among the living. The primary object of this phrase seems to be those who are counted among the mortal living. Temporally, those who survive the judgments identified in 2 Nephi 3 will be among the living. The phrase may also refer to the book of life, speaking spiritually of those who are written in the Lamb's book of life and who will go to God's kingdom of heaven. 14 verse 4, washed, purged. The filth of the children of Israel, including us, will be washed away by the ordinance of baptism and the cleansed by the blood of Jesus, a process in which the Holy Ghost plays a prominent role. Joseph Smith taught that, quote, as the Holy Ghost falls upon one of the literal seed of Abraham, it is calm and serene, and his soul, soul and body are only exercised by the pure spirit of intelligence, while the effect of the Holy Ghost upon a Gentile is to purge out the old blood and make him actually of the seed of Abraham, end of quote. The words blood and filth, the blood of humanity often represents iniquity, Paradoxically, Jesus' blood is able to purge and cleanse our souls from iniquity because of Jesus' innocence, sinlessness, and perfection. In its root sense, the Hebrew word for filth has reference to human excrement. The term is used symbolic to emphasize the terrible nature of the sins of Israel and the impurities found within the daughters of Zion. The phrase spirit of judgment or burning Meaning, together, God's judgment and his cleansing fires will purge Israel of her sins. God's fire destroys the wicked while at the same time purifying the humble and repentant. Chapter 14, verse 5, the phrase, Every dwelling place of Mount Zion. Isaiah compares Zion's individual homes to temples, thus emphasizing the sanctity of Zion and her people in this glorious day. The phrase cloud of smoke slash fire, these are elements that often accompany a theophany of God's presence in the temple. For instance, God appeared at the Sinai sanctuary and was accompanied by a cloud, smoke, fire, and similar elements associated with Solomon's temple and the temple in heaven. The cloud symbolizes the Lord's glory. The people of the Latter-day Zion will be so righteous that they will enjoy such blessings. The phrase, such shall be a defense, meaning the word defense should read canopy or protective covering. Hence, Zion and her inhabitants will be protected by God from spiritual harm in the same way that individuals are protected from physical harm by seeking shelter during the heat of the day or in a great storm. 14 verse 6, shelter, refuge, covert. Similar language is used in modern-day Revelation, in which Zion is called a city of refuge and a place of safety. It will be a land of peace, and the terror of the Lord also shall also be there, insomuch that the wicked will not come unto it. And it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. And it shall be said among the wicked, Let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand." Jesus, of course, is our ultimate refuge and shelter from life's battles. The words storm and rain, these are symbols for God's judgments upon the wicked. The storms remove the wicked from their places as chaff is removed from the wheat, while the righteous like wheat are gathered into the protective units and preserved in the temples and other holy places. When Moroni visited Joseph Smith in September of 1823, he quoted Isaiah 4, verses 5 through 6, and said that this prophecy would soon find fulfillment. Many of the events that take place in our day of this prophecy has direct relevance for us. Chapter 14, verse 6, the phrase Zion to be a place of refuge. In Doctrine and Covenants 45, 62 through 72, the sacred and protective status of Zion for the gathered Israel in the latter days is described. 
Doctrine and Covenants 105, 31 through 32 speaks of how the glory of Zion shall be her defense. Isaiah prepared the protecting divine influence with that experience by Moses. Elder Orson Pratt suggested that the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy would be literal. Quote, the time is to come when God will meet with all the congregation of his saints and to show his approval, and he does love them. He will work a miracle by covering them in the cloud of his glory. I do not mean something that is invisible, but I mean that same order of things which once existed on the earth so far as the tabernacle of Moses was concerned, which was carried in the midst of the children of Israel as they journeyed in the wilderness. But in the latter days there will be a people so pure in Mount Zion, with a house established on the tops of the mountains, that God will manifest himself not only in their temple and upon all her assemblies, upon their assemblies, with a visible cloud during the day, but when the night shall come, if they shall be assembled for worship, God will meet with them by his pillar of fire. And when they reside to their inhabitants, behold, each inhabitation will be lighted upon by the glory of God, a pillar of flaming fire by night. Did you ever hear of any city that was thus favored and blessed since the day that Isaiah delivered this prophecy? No, it is a latter day work, one that God must consummate in the latter times when he begins to reveal himself and show forth his power among the nations. Thank you for watching. Hopefully that has helped you with some of the phrases and terms and meanings of Isaiah. And if you enjoyed the presentation, please hit the like button.